right. Can we model mechanistic and mathematical models to understand this process? Well, of course, I wouldn't be saying this if the answer wasn't yes. Um, the first one for carbon, I'm not going to spend much time on because what? Jib did it. You all should, this should, should be a familiar equation, right? The isotopic composition of, of carbon is a function of the air plus the diffusion fractionation, the Rubisco fractionation, CICA. Can I, can I leave this? Everybody got it? Okay. But, if, but what you haven't been exposed to really is, is the modeling of oxygen or, or hydrogen. Okay, so water isotopes is what we're going to spend more time on. This can be visualized to some extent here. This is the meteoric water line, right? And this is the input water the tree is getting, whatever it is. And so what happens when there's transpiration, you've all done this in class, there'll be transpirational evaporative enrichment in your leaves. Right? And you need to find out what that evaporative enrichment is and how far off the meteoric waterline it is. At that point, then you have biochemical fractionations that then modify it to cellulose. And what's interesting for the hydrogen is that the cellulose looks an awful lot like the source water. Remember that one-to-one -one relationship I showed you a long time ago? They look really similar. And some people thought, well, that's just because the cellulose represents source water. No, it's because the fractionations do you remember those fractionations? There's one that's minus 170 and one that's plus 166. They offset each other. So there's huge fractionations going on here, but they just basically make a similar thing. What is this one? Fractionation for oxygen. 27 per mil water carbonyl fractionation. Remember that? That's the 27 per mil fractionation right there. So those, that's what we're basically showing you at this point. You can also visualize it this way as a source water, leaf water, organic matter, et cetera. So all of these things require, the first thing is, what is leaf water? Okay? And Jim introduced this, and uh, Gabe introduced this, and it's called the Craig Gordon model. And so again, let, let's just review this to some extent. The Craig Gordon, you know, don't get, don't get intimidated by this math. There's nothing, nothing really strange here. This is the xylem water or source water coming up the veins. What is going into the, the leaf, right? At that point, there's evaporation. There's a phase change. That's an equilibrium reaction, right? Phase changes going in and out. So guess what? Guess what? That's temperature dependent. So we need to know the temperature of the leaf and we can get the equilibrium fractionation at the phase change. Then there's water vapor inside the leaf that's going to leave the leaf through the stomata. Guess what? That's a kinetic fractionation. Remember that? It's because it's the lighter isotopes are faster than the heavier isotopes. Kinetic fractionation. What is going to drive that kinetic fractionation? The gradient of vapor pressure in to the uh, vapor pressure out. Call that the vapor pressure deficit. How much of a driving force is there for evaporation? You could think of it as the humidity gradient if you want. I don't care. So, the vapor pressure gradient plus the kinetic fractionation. There's one feature that many people don't think too much about is this one. The isotopic composition of the vapor outside the leaf, the atmospheric vapor. What is that? If it's in, oftentimes it's in equilibrium with source water, but it doesn't always have to be. <coughs> and if there is a significant disequilibrium between water vapor outside your leaf and source water, nature abhors a disequilibrium, right? And, and water vapor can actually go, the, at least isotopically, can go in. You can label leaves with water vapor because it will, it will exchange until that e equilibrium is dissipated. So that's a part of it. So here we go. Source water, kinetic fractionation, equilibrium fractionation, the water vapor, source water difference, kinetic again, vapor pressure gradient. It's a simple equation. Now, unfortunately, the simple equation has now been complicated. And, um, Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't say unfortunately completely, there's some very good science going on here. But there are other factors because this Craig Gordon model doesn't necessarily represent what the true bulk leaf water is. So this is the, the, the uh, water at the site of evaporation. So when you take a, a leaf and you extract it in the water extraction line, you're getting all the water in the leaf. All of it, not just the, leaf, the water at the site of evaporation. So oftentimes this underestimates uh, the, the, the bulk leaf water and the Craig Gordon model don't match because they're not really talking about the same thing. And that's led to a couple other corrections and things that people have done with 
done about, uh, one's called the Peclé effect, which deals with a transpirational flux and a back diffusion of evaporative water. I'm going to go into this only briefly in another slide, so, but it's, it has to do with a physical phenomenon that, that's probably working. There's other people that look at the um, heterogeneity. There are regions of the leaf that are not transpiring and they're, they're contributing di uh, different amounts. Um, and there's other things like that. And then if that's not the, the case, this is a steady state equation. This is at equilibrium. Life is not always at equilibrium. So Lucas Cernusek has done a lot of non-steady state equations for this. And they get even more complicated. So you can see you could get, things could get ramped up. And, we'll, and I'll tell you um, my opinion on some of this stuff a little later. So this is the model that we developed uh, with Jim a few years ago, and this is the equation. It's not really all that uh, complicated. This is the, uh, the oxygen to deuterium in cellulose is a function of leaf water developed by one of these kinds of equations, right, the Craig Gordon. So this is the, all that information is in the leaf water. The source water and a, this F value is the proportion of carbon bound hydrogen oxygen that undergoes exchange when you make cellulose, how much of that is going to exchange. And where they're exchanging at is the source water or the stem water. Then at this point, you have what we call an autotrophic fractionation. The autotrophic fractionation is photosynthesis. That's an autotroph. So it's what it, that's the NADPH system. And that's you know, the minus 171. And then when you make cellulose, you're making cellulose in the stem. That's a heterotrophic fractionation because you're at a different location. And that's the uh, plus 158. And then, um, uh, so this is the, the basic, I think the next slide will make it clear, it's more a cartoon. Um, and fi but finally, the, the oxygen here, this EO, is, is not different. Heterotrophic and autotrophic do not differ because they're all the same 27 per mil water carbonyl thing. So that's one of the differences between carbon and oxygen. So that's, this, this might make it clear. Okay, so what you have here is precipitation, soil water, whatever the inputs of water going into the tree, and the, the roots don't fractionate. So the xylem water is whatever the source is. This is the xylem water. Then it goes up to the leaf, and now it's now leaf water. Okay? Leaf water is not the same as xylem water because of the Craig Gordon, this evaporative enrichment, kin uh, equilibrium and kinetic fractionation, and all the rest of that stuff. So the water in the leaf is now different, evaporatively enriched. In that, in, in that medium, you do the photosynthetic Calvin cycle. You do an autotrophic fractionation. You make sugars that have uh, that, that system. Those sugars are then transported down the tree, with what we call the phloem. You may not remember that, but the phloem and the cambium where you make the tree ring. And here you're now making cellulose at the tree ring. This is now the heterotrophic fractionation. The heterotrophic fractionation is going from uh, sucrose to cellulose, but you're in a different medium water. You're, not, you're no longer in leaf water. You're now in xylem water where, where you're doing that exchange. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the way we do it. So let's see if you, let's think about this for a second. Suppose I didn't want to do tree rings. What if I wanted to do leaf cellulose? What if I want to do leaf cellulose? What would be the change in my model? What's that? Which one? What would this be? Where do you make cellulose? In what water medium are you making cellulose? In the leaf. Leaf water. So this would be leaf water for this and leaf water for that. Right? And that's, what we, that's all you would change you'd have to do to do a leaf cellulose thing versus a tree ring cellulose. You've got to know where the cellulose is being made. What is the water environment where it's being made? Does that make sense? You got it? Okay. All right, so let's see if this little model works. So one of the things that I did in Jim's lab was we grew hydroponics, which is you know, in water tanks, a lot of riparian trees at different humidities, but we, we, we uh, labeled the source, the water in those tanks to a lot of different values. So this is what the model predicts the delta deuterium content would be. This is what the measured cellulose was, modeled 18O, measured 18O. Those lines are one-to-one -one relationships, okay? The difference between the black and the white circles is humidity. I grew some in high humidity and low humidity. 
Can the model account for that? Yep. Okay. So uh, one of the things this model gives you is this ratio of F. Remember that F is the proportion that exchanges. And what we find is that about 40% of the oxygens that were in the leaf water exchange by the time they get to the cellulose. So the cellulose represents about 60% of those oxygens came from the leaf and about 40% are done in, the, in the, the stem water. So you have some information of the evaporative conditions of the, of the environment from the leaf, but you also have some of them that are, are damped out because of the stem. So that's what that FO gives you. Okay? Now, some of these models then have gone more and more complicated. Uh, uh, Arthur Gessler in Germany has done a lot of work with trying to understand the details. This model is very complicated. You know, here's the needle, organic matter, water, phloem, hours, 12 hours, 6 hours, to here, to here, to here. Really finely tuning when all this happens. One of the things they found was that with an environmental perturbation, it takes about two weeks for that environmental perturbation to reach the, the tree ring. That's, that's good information to know. How long does, it, how long does that, that, that lag time, if you will, in the carbohydrate systems? So there's some pretty comp more complicated models here. And there's another one I want to highlight by uh, Ansgar Kamen that came out a few years ago. And Ansgar Kamen has this system. He says, look it, you give me three things, source water, vapor pressure of the air, temperature of the air, bang. I will put it in this little black box and I'll come up with stem cellulose and leaf cellulose. Just give me three parameters and I'll, get, I'll, I'll describe it for you. Now there's a lot in this box, unfortunately, that you have to be, you know, there's a lot going on in there. And one of the things for Chris, if you, if you want to talk to me later, there's the Peclet effect right there within this system. And he's using the Peclet effect, but to be honest with you, there's a number of things that are not included. The effective path length isn't included, and so you have to know what that is. So there's, there's more complicated. But this is sort of a simplifying thing, and what he's shown is that these leaf cellulose or stem cellulose is really dependent on vapor pressure deficit. The, the leaf cellulose is greater, is a, a steeper slope than the stem cellulose. Anybody want to hazard a guess why? There's more of a, a gradient here. Okay. It's because of that. Remember that? 40% are exchanging. So if you just do leaf cellulose, you're going to get all the evaporative conditions. This has some of the evaporative conditions, but it's also exchanged with source water. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Did I lose you? Okay, see how this slope is steeper than this one? So this is what we call that a dampening of the information of the vapor pressure. Why? It's because when you're looking at this model, some of this information, all the information about evaporative enrichment is in leaf water. The stem water is not enriched. Remember that? So you have this information in the autotrophic fractionation. That's where you're getting your evaporative enrichment information, VPD information. But when you come to here, you exchange some of that with xylem water. About 40% of it exchanges. So you lose some of that information. It's, we call it dampening. And that's why it's still there. Now, so why don't we just do leaf cellulose if we want evaporative conditions? Well, great. You might have a conifer needle that's four or five years old, but that's it. With tree rings, I can go back hundreds of years. So that, I mean, that's the trade-off. You're, you're losing some of the signal, but you have a longer record. So this modeling stuff leads to what I call a dichotomy. Okay? The dichotomy is that we've done great strides in research and making, going beyond some of the complicated things. Leaf water gets more complicated with the Peclet effect, more complicated with uh, non-steady state conditions. Uh, um, these guys get more and more complicated when the things are happening. So we're making great, and these are good information, the, the good science, but what it tends to do is it makes the model, yes, less useful. Why? Because I can't parameterize it. There's so many variables in their models, and I have to guess on the parameterization. And there's more that I have to guess on the parameterization. The, how, the, the, this Peclet model requires an, an estimate of transpiration. What's the transpiration rate of that tree? Well, how do I know what the transpiration rate is 100 years ago? I have to guess. I have to guess and put it in the model, right? So the more parameters you get, sometimes the less useful the model is, OK? And in my opinion, the, more, the simpler models will capture at least 90 to 95% of your variation. So the, the, the basic Craig Gordon model is capturing most of your, your thing. You can go to the extra stuff, 
but you're gaining only a little bit. You following me? The other component is, is simplifying, and this is what Ansgarth, give me three things, I'll give you, this is sort of simplifying the concept. And that makes them useful for predictions of, of the past. Another thing is that many studies simply ignore modeling altogether. The vast majority of tree ring studies you will see take a 50-year record of tree ring isotope variation, then they'll take a 50-year record of local meteorological conditions from a weather station, and then they find correlations. This isotope correlates with summer temperature. This isotope correlates with winter precipitation. Just a, st a straight statistical correlation. And then what do you do with that? Well, you say, now that I have the correlation, now I'm going to go back 300 years where I don't have weather stations. And I'm going to make predictions of those things. That's what the vast majority of them do. And, I, and, that, and that's valid. It's fine. Um, but what I would recommend in terms of modeling is this. When you decide to make an interpretation of your variation in isotopic values, one of the good exercises you can do is get a hold of one of these models, and we'll give you one. They're on Excel. They're easy to use. And just plug in numbers. If you think temperature is going to have that much of a change in isotope, plug in temperature. Does it give you the changes you're expecting? Plug in, you know, changes in stomatal conductance. How much of a change in stomatal conductance do you need to have to get a one per mil change in isotopes based on the model? And if, it's, and if the number you get is, I need uh, a two orders of magnitude higher stomatal conductance to get the thing I'm expecting, forget it. Plants don't have two orders of magnitude differences in stomatal conductance, you know, from one year to the next. And they might have it drought versus, you know. So the, the concept here is play with the model to see if your interpretation is reasonable. Following me? That's one of the things you can use models for. And then, and then you, you move on. Questions? I'm not sure how, how I'm doing it.